Thanks for coming out today. My name is Jacob Mazur. I'm one of the programmers here at Bryn Mawr Film Institute. And I would like to introduce you to a fellow who knows a thing or two about dinosaurs. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, he was the dinosaur advisor for this very film. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dino Don Lessum. Less than five minutes, that's good. Yo. Hello. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy actually to see one of my ex-employees here who I haven't seen in years. So forgive me, Sarah, if I repeat things you've heard 5,000 times. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little about myself, so then maybe you think I'm more important than I am. Uh, I've been working on dinosaurs for 30 years. I used to be a reporter at the Boston Globe, and I hadn't thought about dinosaurs since I was the age of some of these younger guys, about eight. And I moved on to girls and baseball, which are still interests me. So uh, the Globe sent me on a story. The magazine section said, why don't you go write about these crazy dinosaur guys? There were two very famous guys th then, and they're still pretty well known. Jack Horner, who discovered the first eggs and babies of dinosaurs, and Bob Bakker, who was a real long neck guy who's always on documentaries. Uh, he looks like birds are nesting in his hair. So I wrote a story about that, and I thought, God, this is fascinating life. I don't want to work at the newspaper anymore. I'll just do things with dinosaurs, legal things. And so I went out on, uh, and met every guy who does dinosaurs. At that time, there were no gals. There, uh, 35 people in the world are all that there is who dig dinosaurs. Uh, it's amazing for all the kids in the world who say they're going to be paleontologists, you lie. And you don't grow up to do it, which is a shame. But things like making a living get in the way. So uh, in the process of that, I got to know this tall guy named Michael Crichton, who you may have heard of. And he wrote the book Jurassic Park. I had actually, the time that book came out, I had just gotten back from going on two digs, one in China and directly to one in the North Slope of Alaska, where it's extremely cold, even in the summer. And I kind of forgot that coming from central China. So I was freezing my butt off. So I went to the nearest store and bought all the clothes I could find. Only I'm colorblind, so I showed up at the dig entirely dressed in purple. <laughs> so the guys there were very sweet, and they gave me the, literally the clothes off their back. And I realized in that moment that something should be done. All these things, like this forthcoming book, are promoting dinosaurs right and left. But dinosaurs aren't fictitious, except in this movie. And somebody needs to be compensating the scientists. They can't compensate the dinosaurs anymore for their, the use of all this information that science is providing. So I started a nonprofit. And when I talked to Crichton about his book, I mentioned this. And he uh, is a very direct person. He was. He said, uh, you're wrong. I said, OK, how should I do it? And he told me, and he said, well, here's some money, which was incredibly nice of him. He later gave, and since he's not around, I could say now, he gave $150,000 to research uh, from the movie. So uh, I didn't know this, but when they were making the movie, he recommended me and the charity to Spielberg. I was not, uh, as was said, the only scientific advisor. The main advisor was this guy, Jack Horner. Uh, Jack Horner's utility to movies is a little limited because he can't read. Uh, he's dyslexic and he's flunked out of 17 schools before they realized what the problem was. So uh, they, they could use somebody who could read a script. And I first showed up at the, at the Jurassic Park set when they were filming in the desert. First of all, how many of you guys have seen the movie Jurassic Park? Wait, how many people have not seen the movie Jurassic Park? Really? Holy cow. There are people alive who have not seen this movie. Well, you missed your chance to really give Spielberg a lot of money. Uh, his deal, by the way, was that he got a third of the gross of the movie, only if he was any time late in making movies, often movies run months late in the making, and every day cost the studio an enormous amount of money. So his deal was if he went, each day he went late, he owed them a million dollars. So he started storyboarding, in other words, making like cartoon pages of everything that would happen in the movie two years beforehand. And they shot the entire movie in 25 days, and he finished three days early. So he was quite good at managing his money. Uh, the, uh, uh, so, the, so I get to the set. The first place I got to was, well, first I should ask you. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask. How many people now have seen the movie more than once? How many people have seen it more than twice? How many people watch too much TV with too little supervision? 
I, this, that question could have been how many of you need advanced psychotherapy? <laughs> in any case, it's my favorite of the movies because it's the only one I worked for. Uh, in terms of the importance of a scientific advisor to a movie, it's reflected in the credits. Spielberg is probably the first name. You'll have to like sweep away the popcorn until you find mine. Everybody in North America worked on this movie and I'm probably the last guy credited in the whole thing. That's because it's a fictional film and they just want you around for the patina of legitimacy about it. So I first arrive at this movie set. I had worked on documentaries where there's never more than three people and you end up holding the sound even though you're the in quotes talent. Uh, and there, they've lit the Mojave Desert in the middle of daytime. That's how much equipment there are. And there are 100 people working there. I think the thing that most impressed me about this desert scene was that they served shrimp in the craft tent. <laughs> how do you get cold shrimp into the Mojave Desert? I'll, I still don't know the answer to that. So uh, I, I get there, and I'm in like in the back row of hundreds of levels of technicians, dozens of levels, and Spielberg's sitting in a chair in the front. He's actually working the camera, which they're not allowed to tell you he does because of the union, but he wanted to run the dolly shots. Uh, I'm way in the back, and Laura Dern, the woman in the movie, uh, who's a paleobotanist, says something about something that's on this screen that the guy is tapping. Do you remember this scene? Raise your hand if you remember it. All right. Uh, Thank you So for remembering. So she, uh, in the, when, I'm, when they were filming, she said, oh, the curl of this dinosaur tail, it took millions of years to get like that. And I was with my minder, like the third assistant director, and I said, this is wrong. This happens, you get rigor mortis when you die in a matter of hours. So this dinosaur curled up his neck and his tail when his muscles got rigid very shortly after he died. So then I see the woman go up a little bit, and then somebody go up a little more. It was like I was in the Merrill Lynch commercials they used to do. Finally, it gets to this little guy in the front named Spielberg, and he said, who said that? And I thought, holy cow, I just got here. I didn't even eat the shrimp, and, and I'm out of this joint. So uh, he said, okay, whoever said that, come up here. So I go up there, and I meet him, and he says, rewrite this line. And I said, okay. Um, some guy had spent two years who's professional doing this, but I'll rewrite it. And I rewrote it, and they said, no, make it sound more technical. So I said, okay. So when you watch the movie, you'll see now Laura Dern say, oh, it's post-mortem rigor mortis of the something or whatever. Oh, post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Which no scientist would talk like. they just say, oh, it's dead. So, so that would pretty much be my contribution to the movie, except the weirdest thing for me was seeing a dig being faked. In the Mojave Desert, or what they call Sweetwater, Montana, you're not allowed to dig a hole because it's state land. So they had built fake walls to make a fake hole of rock. Then they had fake paleontologists digging that hole to expose a fake dinosaur. That was a little uh, bizarre to me. What was most bizarre was that these guys were all wearing like button-down shirts. They said they're on a dig, they haven't had a bath in a week. What are you, what are you doing here? And they said, well, you, you know, uh, we thought that's what you do. I said, no, you wear dirty T-shirts. And they said, where are we going to get dirty T-shirts? I said, I have a suitcase. <laughs> so if you look very closely, the, the most important thing in this movie is that you'll see somebody wearing a blue T-shirt with a dinosaur on it, Fellman's Ace Hardware. That's another key contribution I made to this film. Uh, another thing to, uh, of note is that... Um, Everything is wrong in this movie, pretty much, scientifically. So, excuse me one sec. We could talk a little about the dinosaurs in the film uh, and what's wrong with each one, but I'm sure you, you know that there was something wrong. I did say, this is called Jurassic Park, even to Crichton before it was a movie. I said, this is called Jurassic Park, but most of the dinosaurs here are Cretaceous. He said, okay, you try and say Cretaceous Park. It doesn't really work. Uh, so, of course, the dinosaurs are in the wrong time period. Let's take, for instance, the T-Rex. That's actually closest to reality. It's a little oversized. But T-Rex only had to be faster than a clunky triceratops to make a living at then. So when the Jeep goes away, in second gear, it would have been gone from the T-Rex. But the most egregious mistake, I think, with the T-Rex is what happens to the lawyer. Do you remember what happens to the lawyer? The lawyer is in, on a toilet bowl in the bathroom, and T-Rex crashes through, grabs him by the waist, shakes him, and eats him. Well, first of all, 
There's this thing called professional courtesy between lawyers and dinosaurs. They're practically <laughs> the same species. This would never happen. Uh, second, second thing is that T-Rex could eat an entire kindergarten in one bite, which is about 500 pounds. So he would have eaten the lawyer and the toilet bowl and part of the concrete in one bite. Uh, and when they say, oh, stand still, T-Rex won't see you. Well, he might not see you, although he had very good binocular vision, but he would smell you and he would think, oh, appetizer, let's, let's get started. So T-Rex is closest to reality. Furthest is Dilophosaurus. Do you know the little spitter dinosaur? And he spits on Newman. I gotta tell you, the person I was most impressed to, to, to see on the set was Newman. I mean, that's a real star to me. <laughs> In any case, he got gobbed by these little spitters and he dies. Well, Dilophosaurus was the first large meat-eating dinosaur. It was 20 feet long. It didn't have those frills. Those were taken from an Australian lizard that's still alive today. And no dinosaur spat poison. Other than that, it's dead on. <laughs> so what, what they wanted, of course, was a cool little dinosaur that you think is nice but turns out not to be. So what the heck. Um, and uh, Velociraptor. So uh, Velociraptor in the movie, well, I first met Velociraptor on a coat hanger. I walked into the studio's uh, back room and there were six Veloc Velociraptor suits hanging up. And I thought, oh my God, these things are as big as me. The real Velociraptor is the size of a poodle. So when the guy Muldoon, who's the guy with the hat and the shorts, who's kind of the park uh, guard, says, watch out for Velociraptor. They're as smart as chimpanzees. They're as fast as cheetahs and they can remember. If it was the truth, he would have said, ah, don't pay too much attention to Velociraptor. He's the size of a poodle. Uh, he's about as smart as an ostrich, a dumb bird, and he can't remember much at all. Uh, wouldn't make much of a movie. In fact, a realistic movie about dinosaurs would have been a lot of eating, farting, and pooping. That's pretty much what happened in dinosaur times. Plant eaters greatly outnumbered the meat eaters. T-Rex, like a lion, would be sleeping most of the time. When he ate, he might be eating what's much easier to get takeout than to go and kill something. He would have taken what's already dead and been a scavenger most of the time. It's just more efficient. And if he hunted, he would miss nine times out of 10, which a lion did. So that makes for one terrible movie. So none of that happened. Uh, another thing to think about is just the basic premise. Uh, as you re probably remember, you've seen it. I'm not really spoiling the movie for you guys. Well, you decide afterwards. Uh, it's DNA, right? Mr. DNA. And the story with Mr. DNA, the little cartoon movie guy, is he explains that a mosquito, the blood in amber was found in this fossilized tree sap. They took that information, uh, they got the DNA, but there wasn't enough, so they mixed it with a frog, and then they were able to recreate these dinosaurs who may or may not have bred. Well, I don't know where to start with the mistakes in this. There's more mistakes than there are facts in this. There is amber. But there's only lately been found amber with dinosaur, in fact, a raptor uh, tail in it. But at that time, there was none known. Uh, what else? You don't know, if you got blood and amber, what the mosquito was eating. And only female mosquitoes, by the way, qualify. So it could have been any animal, a little mammal, our ancestors. What else? Uh, let's see. Uh, why mix it with a frog? Birds are living dinosaurs. A McNugget is a dinosaur. Your dinosaurs taste like chicken and you're eating a dinosaur every day. Well, you're chicken eaters. So what, what is the basis uh, for doing this? I asked Crichton, I said, this doesn't really make sense. He said, yeah, I know, I skipped some parts. So now we actually have DNA discovered right within T-Rex bones. So we're a lot closer, which is still miles away, from recreating a dinosaur. What we have is like one name in a phone book. I don't know if you remember a phone book, but it used to be where you put all the names. What are you going to mix it with? You'd mix it with a bird and you'd get a chickenosaur. But you could, you could breed them to look a lot like a dinosaur. But it really, at heart, would not be much of a dinosaur. And then the, the underlying important question is why bother? Uh, if dinosaurs were alive today, uh, one sneeze would kill them all. It's kind of like what we did to Native Americans. And the plants that they lived in were very different from the plants we have today full of alkaloids that would have killed them. So. With that, I'll leave the rest to questions, except 
you know about continuity? There's a continuity person on every set. They are like what my friend Ben Yagoda does to commas in print. Their job is to find the errors in a movie and stop the movie from guy having guys wear the wrong shirt in the next scene or the car door being open. Anyway, there are at least 93 continuity mistakes. I hope this person was fired shortly after the movie. But I want you to look out for a couple. I don't know how people notice these things, but the continuity person accepted to that. Uh, watch the Jeep that the lawyer is in in the beginning, for instance. Uh, Jeep door is closed, and the Jeep door is open, and the Jeep door is closed. What, what happened there? Uh, when he's in the bathroom, the toilet holder uh, rack is horizontal, then it's vertical, then it's horizontal again. Lex, when you meet her, the girl, she is wearing a tank top with a pattern. The pattern of that shirt changes at least three times. So there's a, there's a lot to look behind the scenes in the film. I hope you enjoy it. Those of you who don't see it, haven't seen it before are in for a great treat. To me, the first view of dinosaurs in this movie, which was the second dinosaurs, actually. First, they're in a Jeep and they see T-Rex and they pronounce it strangely. A T-Rex, we have a T-Rex. Say again. <laughs> we have a T-Rex. And then they see an overview of a, of a, do you remember this, of a valley? And there are all these dinosaurs around the water. That, at that point, was the mo by far the most realistic depiction of dinosaurs ever made. You know, what you watch this movie, that was some of the first CG ever done. And the movie feels full of dinosaurs. There were, uh, dinosaurs only appear in any form in 13 minutes in this two-hour movie. That's how good a director Spielberg is, that he makes you feel the presence of these dinosaurs all along. And by the way, they were made three ways, and you only know about two. Computer graphics, but you can't have, say, take the kitchen scene where, giraffe, where the velociraptor's attacking in the kitchen. You can't have computer graphics with an object in the center. There needs to be projection in the back. At least in those days, you couldn't. And there are robotics. I think you know that the Stan Winston Studios did a lot of robotics for this. But there's a third way, and that's why there were big dinosaur suits which is you can't get a Ninja Turtle guy into a little poodle-sized suit. And so in order to make that kitchen scene, they needed somebody to be able to jump up on the counter. So they hired the guys who were Ninja Turtles to jump up on the counter. And Spielberg never wanted people to know that. In fact, he was so secretive about the movie that the dinosaurs were kept in sheets all the time. And the, the show 2020 came to do a segment on this. And they showed up, and he was a day behind at that point. He caught up. And they said, we're ready to shoot. And he said, no. Uh, we're not doing that scene, and I'm not changing it for you, and you can go away. So, so he had little interest in this. But there was a third dinosaur guy besides me and Jack Horner named Bob Bakker, the guy in the long hair, and he kept saying that he was an advisor to Jurassic Park. He had nothing to do with the movie. So it got on Spielberg's nerves. And in the second movie, if you've seen the Jurassic World movie, a long-haired scientist gets eaten in the very beginning of the movie. And that was the retribution. <laughs> anyway... Enjoy the film. I'll be here afterwards, and I hope to take many questions from you that I can't answer. Thank you. Hello. Oh, Hi. it's working. Hey, Hi. guys. <laughs> I forgot how good it is. <laughs> um, since the credits are rolling in the back, uh, th if those who are staying have a riotous round of applause if you ever see my name. It should be about 20 minutes from now. Uh, I said I would take questions, but I did want to say one thing first, which is that something very good came out of this movie besides money for Spielberg. Uh, I said at the end of the movie, at the behest of the guy who made the skeletons, uh, could I have the dinosaurs? And uh, Spielberg said, why? And I said, because I want to make a mo uh, an exhibit about what's wrong with this movie. And he said, sure. Um, and so we took all the sets and props and dinosaurs and we made an exhibit that started in New York and went all over the world and we raised $3 million for dinosaur research, which is the most money by far uh, for digging that ever went on. And in order to do that, I felt it was wrong for me to take any money for working on the movie. God knows why they would pay me anyway. But my mother, who's now turning 100, tells me every week, you're the only guy who didn't get paid on that movie. So. Uh, it was well worth it. Uh, I would like to tell you a little about the actors, but first I wanted to take some questions from you guys, if you have them. Anybody? Let yes. me run over to you with a microphone so everyone can hear. 
I have several questions, but uh -oh. I guess I'll go with the one I've been wondering about for the longest. So if I'm not mistaken, in 1993, it was not yet known that dinosaurs had feathers. So my question is, in your professional opinion, with feathers, would these dinosaurs have been more or less terrifying? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, as you know, Velociraptor is a much smaller animal. So I don't know, would you be more scared of a turkey in the freezer or a turkey <laughs> walking around? Uh, I think uh, they would have been more fascinating to me, and it would be nice if they updated the movies in some way. It would be hard to do that. But uh, now we not only know that there were feathers on many of these small meat eaters and perhaps even larger meat eaters and who knows what about other dinosaurs, but we know some of the colors and so they would have been brightly colored animals. You know, it's always conservative to make these green and brown kind of creatures. But in truth, if they're closely related to birds as they are, they should have, and they actually have large nerve openings uh, for eyesight. And so that suggests in many ways that these would have been very colorful animals. So it'd be kind of cool and scary. Uh, another question. Um, um, were there... Why weren't there pterodactyls and the, the flying ones? Yes. W were there pterodactyls? Oh, uh, they had a bad union. So they never, <laughs> they never got represented. Uh, I think they're in maybe the third one, but they should have been there. I mean, it was a choice in this supposed story which animals they wanted to bring back, and I guess they weren't so interested in pterodactyls, which would be definitely cool because... Quetzalcoatlus, which lived at this time, is the size of a fighter plane. That's an amazing animal. Yes. So talking about sizes, how big were some of these animals in, in real life? Uh, big. <laughs> the, how uh, big? My, my <laughs> It sounds like a Johnny Carson question. Uh, well, my daughter, when she was 12 years old, found the biggest bone ever in the world. Uh, we were in Argentina, and it belongs to a dinosaur, not surprisingly, called Argentinosaurus. That is still the biggest dinosaur. So the backbone that she found, if you reach around and feel yours, the back of your neck, it's about the size of a dime on, on the young man who asked the question. On us old folks, it's maybe the size of a quarter. This dinosaur was five feet high and five feet wide, and as a fossil weighed two tons. Uh, and so that animal, Argentinosaurus, weighed as much as 50 elephants. It was 25 feet high and more than 100 feet long. Uh, it's as big as a blue whale. So some dinosaurs, you know, amazing. That animal is 10 times the size of a T-Rex. And a T-Rex is 40 feet long. So imagine a creature three school buses long. Uh, a Brachiosaurus is as tall, could look in a fifth story window. So they were stupendous. All right. <laughs> that was not a rousing round of applause. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo. It's not in reverse order of importance. That's how it works. Uh, another question. Yeah. This guy. Why do they choose frogs to replace the missing gaps? Uh, that was some big mistake. Um, I think they thought a frog would be cute in the animation. So and as, as I said, Crichton really had no answer for that at that time. Uh, there was already, as you can see in the movie, the idea that birds are living dinosaurs. So it was kind of a really peculiar choice to do that. Others? You get your second question if you want, this young lady who had, who had multiples. <laughs> um, I, my other question, I guess, was how involved Creighton was. I know he um, worked on the adaptation with a co-writer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how involved was he after that? Was he on set? Was he... No, he wasn't even involved that much in the adaptation. He had been a director briefly, and he hated actors. Um, so, and Spielberg actually loves children, but he's not very fond of adult actors in general. So Crichton came to visit the set one day, and I heard them saying, uh, Spielberg said to Crichton, I think this movie's going to generate a billion dollars. And Crichton said, oh, baloney. And it generated a billion dollars. And then Spielberg was talking about the value of this computer generation. He said, you know, in another 20 years, we're probably going to be able to computer, age, computer generate the actors, and we won't need actors anymore. And Crichton said, thank God. <laughs> so, which brings up the question of what, why. Well, uh, one of the calls I got early on was from Sam Neill in the middle of the night, the guy who plays uh, the paleontologist. And I said, hi, what's up? 
He said, I want some tapes, videotapes. I said, okay, what of? Uh, David Attenborough, the brother of the guy who played the runner, guy who runs the park. I said, well, what do you want those for? He said, uh, I said, he, you know, the paleontologist is loosely based on Jack Horner, although he, Jack Horner loves children and hates grown-ups. So why don't I send you a tape of Jack Horner, who's a really, you know, monosyllabic Montanan? He said, I asked for David Attenborough. I said, okay. So um, he was a difficult guy, um, and Laura Dern was charming. And then afterwards, a friend of mine actually turned out to be her agent, and he said, she's very good at playing a human being. Jeff Goldblum was exactly as you see Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> and I, I loved him. I'm sitting around the set one day, and, and that was the first that I saw him. He walked over, and he said, I had a terrible day with my analyst today. And I'm thinking, I don't even know you, and you're telling me the story of your analysis. So after the movie, we did want to shoot some uh, narrative to go with this exhibition. So I asked him if he would do it. No money. He said, sure, where, where do I go? And he showed up and he actually rewrote the lines to, for his character. He did show up with 18 identical t-shirts and a wardrobe person. I'm still trying to figure out how he would choose which of the identical black t-shirts to wear. So he was a character. Uh, any other questions? Hey, um, did the, uh, the research that went into modeling um, some of the, the dinosaurs for the movie uh, in any way assist research that was going on to um, like model the dinosaurs for like museums and more scientific applications? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, they had very good artists uh, in Stan Winston's studios who were drawing the dinosaurs, but uh, as we were talking about earlier, they're not so accurate. They're, they were devoted to making them uh, as dramatic a creature as they could make them. The, um, they're actually sculpted first in clay. And one of the sculptors who worked on this, it's an enormous amount of clay in a T-Rex head. And he had just finished this thing and the clay collapsed. I had to start all over again. Uh, it's not done the same way now. I had the molds for the dinosaurs after the movie so that I could make any number of them for the exhibition. The ones that are in the movie are full of hydraulic fluid. They wouldn't last long, so we wanted to make more solid versions. And uh, we offered them for sale, and one person bought all the dinosaurs. Uh, he, he was Nathan Mirvold. He's the number two guy at Microsoft then, and he wanted them for his garden, $100,000 worth of dinosaurs. And after the, after the run of this exhibit, nine or 10 years, I did auction several of them off, and I do have a couple of them still Right now they're in an exhibition in Finland. And I should also mention that I have an exhibition in the Bronx Zoo with the most accurate robotic dinosaurs ever built, which just opens now on the 19th of April. So if you make it to New York, or at least to the Bronx, the danger is much more in the Bronx than the dinosaurs. And uh, they're full-sized, and they're about as good as robots get. And so they're sculpted in a way uh, with a lot of information now that wasn't available during the time of the movie. Anybody else? This young lady has 17 other questions. Um, oh, in Hi. your opinion, who was your favorite character um, in the movie? Like, in your opinion. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Well, I love Jeff Goldblum's character because Jeff Goldblum is such a cool guy. Um, I did go to Japan with the, with the girl, Lex, and she was very nice. And so I'm kind of fond of her as she was when she's 13. She's probably about 95 now. Um, one thing I should mention is that I was very impressed with Attenborough because he is a great director and actor. And when I went to first meet him, I wanted to say something different than, wow, you're really cool. So there's a British movie made at the time of World War II, which is really good, called The Dam Busters, about these scientists who figure out a way, it was based on a true story, to destroy the German dams. And so I said, you know, I loved you in The Dam Busters. He said, oh, thank you, that was Michael Redgrave. So that was a good start. Anybody else? Yes. Please don't laugh at this. <laughs> We've seen so many things that were considered science fiction that have turned into reality that years ago you never would have thought would have happened. How likely, how possible is it to do this for real, to create something like these animals now? 
Well, we're a long way still. Uh, we were talking before about the, the fact that we have a little genetic information highly degraded over all that time. What we could do, and I think they're working on very hard, is to recreate a mammoth. And that is amazing unto itself. Of course, mammoths were alive in human times, but they get fast frozen. You could make mammoth soup out of some that are in the Siberia. So <clears throat> what you could do for that animal, for instance, is to take elephant DNA, mix it with a bit of mammoth, end up engineering an animal that looks like a mammoth, is not entirely constituted of it, but I think that's on the horizon, and that would be spectacular. It does bring up the question of well, what gives us the business to do this. I don't think it puts us in danger, but it still takes a lot of nerve. Right. <laughs> well, thank you all. If there's, oh, one more. If you have questions after everybody's done, just come up. Hey, just a quick question in general about the film. Um, do you think that because they use practicals instead of primarily CGI that it holds up better than something that was made in like the late 90s, early 2000s? Oh, yeah. Um, there is some CGI. And <clears> the <throat> reason there isn't more is it was so expensive then to do it. But I agree. I think robotics have, when they're really well done, like they were by Winston, they have a three-dimensionality about them that CGI then and still now doesn't quite capture. And so I think part of the way Spielberg manipulated them for terror in having them pop out at you was still would be more effective were it used. And I think nowadays there's not much use of them. The robots that are in the Bronx Zoo, for instance, have a very limited range of motion, and only in the last 10 years have they eliminated Wagga Wagga, which I know will be a great reassurance to you. Wagga Wagga is when a robot moves, it reaches the end of its motion cycle, and it's heavy, so it goes like this. So the ones you would see in the, you know, crummy exhibits do that. Ours don't. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.